Cardella is co-founder and executive director of Local Energy, which helps communities develop their local renewable energy resources. His 23 years of engineering experience includes designing and developing renewable energy systems. Mark has served as technical director for Rebuild New Mexico, a joint program of the New Mexico State Energy Office and the U.S. Department of Energy, where he identified more than $3 million in annual energy savings for New Mexico businesses. And prior to that, Mark co-founded the Southwest Energy Institute to research and promote policies to facilitate the transition to sustainable energy. In 2001, he was chosen by the Union, uh, of the Union of Concerned Citizens to lobby science to lobby Congress on the role of renewable energy businesses in the campaign against the global warming. He is a seasoned writer, teacher, and presenter and has given more than 60 presentations on community-based responses to energy resource degradation. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical and Engineering from Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University and is a licensed professional engineer in the state of New Mexico. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Holly. And thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. We acknowledged three or four or five now VIPs, but I just want to acknowledge all of you for coming here to sit down. You're all VIPs in my mind if you can sit through these presentations. So thank you. I really appreciate you. And it's an honor to come here and speak to you and, and uh, give you another dose of tough information to take in. So, um, thanks for doing that. By the way, this, you know, we haven't had a bathroom break. We were supposed to be a little... This is a misery optional presentation, if you need to go <laughs> Go ahead, you can do that. I'm also not a fan of podiums. Do you guys mind if I use that mic? Go ahead. The podium somehow feels like it separates me from all of you, and I don't like that, so... Um, so that was a pretty tough presentation. Uh, Dr. Barcelona's on uh, surface water and the risks and things associated with not knowing where the groundwater flows and drilling wells in a way that allow contaminants to migrate around from one level to another. Um, I'm going to give you an e equally frightening presentation on surface water. We're going to talk about the Buckman Direct Diversion and what was going on and some of the thinking that was going on as that was being developed. And uh, I'll give you some idea of... Um, of potentially some of the potential risks in it, because the risks were drastically underestimated of this system, as you can probably imagine. So I'm going to do this as a little bit of a guided meditation. So <laughs> you can close your eyes if you want to, but imagine to yourself that it's 1997. Bill Clinton is in the White House. The U.S. economy is the envy of the world, and. Under this notion that the economy is going to grow forever, Santa Fe believes it's going to need a lot more water if we're going to grow, because that's the limiting factor for growth in this community. So in 1997, the Santa Fe conceived the project to divert water from the Rio Grande for drinking. And for about the next 10 years, some of you do have your eyes closed, I'm wondering about <laughs> For the next 10 years, studies were undertaken surrounding this idea, this notion of taking water. You know, we had ex excess water, but we had water rights on the Rio Grande, which we actually purchased back in the 60s. You know all of this, program. And I was just up in Pagosa Springs, Colorado last weekend soaking in the Rio Blanco, one of the most beautiful and clean rivers around this area. Do you know that the Blanco's flow is limited by the fact that in the 60s they sold a lot of that flow to Albuquerque and Santa Fe? And that flow was through a series of tunnels diverged to the Chama River, and through the San Juan Chama diversion, <coughs> taking over the Rio Grande, and then we take it off the Rio Grande yes. through the Buckman Direct Diversion. I know, it's ongoing. Misery optional, you can leave if you don't. <laughs> okay. So that's 1997. Fast forward 10 years, uh, 2007, the location for taking water from the Rio Grande has been finalized. Water will be drawn about three miles downstream from where Los Alamos Canyon dumps into the Rio Grande. Uh, a lot of organizations were pointing out that that's a potential problem to, to take uh, your drinking water from underneath a nuclear waste dump. <laughs> when, I, <laughs> when I use the phrase nuclear waste dump, I want you to recognize too that it, that's a shorthand for, there's actually 2,100 nuclear waste dumps up there, there's toxic dump sites, about 60 of them high priority based on the concentration of PCBs 
In some places, the PCB is 40,000 times the standard for concentration in soil. When I use the term standard, by the way, we're talking about standards like we've been talking about, Arjun was talking about up here, and, and also Dr. Barcelona. The standards are what others believe to be the safe limits. They may, may, may or may not be appropriate standards. So there's some shortcut. So during this 10-year period, and starting really in earnest around mid-2005, 6, and 7, memos were flying back and forth between Santa Fe officials, city and county, as well, back and forth with LAM and DOE officials. And I read a lot of these memos because they're all in Joni's files over at CCNS, and I'll, I'll paraphrase the memos. Uh, Santa Fe letter to Lanel, we're planning to drink that river so you'd best stop polluting it. <laughs> Lanel responds to Santa Fe, we've never polluted the river. <laughs> and this went on and on and on, there's dozens of memos back and forth, and you can, you can read those anytime you like, they're, very, they're entertaining at least. Fall of 2008, Santa Fe breaks ground on the $200 million Buckman diversion. The U.S. plunges into economic crisis. Simultaneous events. Okay, so that's fall of 2008. A year later, fall of 2009, halfway through construction now, Santa Fe officials commissioned a $200,000 study of the risk of landfill contaminants getting on water supply. $100 million down the road. It's time for a risk analysis. Study cost represents 0.1% of project costs. Now let me clear up a little something. I'm using this term risk analysis. It actually wasn't a risk analysis. It was an analysis of the risk analyses that have been done to date. And in fact, there's other reasons why it wasn't a risk analysis, and that's that there was no engineering performed. You know, a risk analysis on a public water supply system involves a number of disciplines. The first one is hydrology, because you know you're building it underneath a nuclear waste dump. So the, the hydrologists have to tell you whether those toxins are going to get down to the river. And uh, I guess there's some geophysics involved in there too for the groundwater contaminants. But And then you have engineers to tell you whether that contaminants that are now in the river get drawn into your water supply system, and then you have toxicologists in the end that tell you whether or not you drink that water with the toxic stuff in it, you're going you're gonna to get hurt. So there's a number of disciplines, but I guarantee you if you leave out the most important component, which is does the toxic water end up in your water supply system, you've, you've not done a risk analysis. And that was the assumption made in the so-called risk analysis. And the, the reason I keep referring to it as a risk analysis is, is it, it was presented in the newspaper as, you know, this group comes up and points out that there's no risk of landfill contaminants getting in the water supply. And if they had said low risk or insignificant risk, I might not have taken notice. But they said no risk. And I've been an engineer for long enough to know that there's no such thing as no risk. So, you know, risk, how can I explain this easily? Risk increases of the, it, with how frequently you engage in risky behavior. Y'all know this? You know? Okay, so the, the odds that you're going to get hurt increase the more times you engage in risky behavior. And I use the example a lot of times of playing Russian roulette. You know, if you load a single bullet in a six shooter and spin the chamber and point the gun at your head, there's only one in six you're going to die. But if you do it all afternoon, you know, and it's the same thing. How many times do you plan on drinking the water out of the bucket of diversion? Are you going to pump it every day for the next 50 years? Yeah. So it, it doesn't take long to figure out that it's a risky thing to do. And in fact, what happened when this so-called risk uh, analysis came out, well, let me not jump ahead to that. The first thing is, when they commissioned this study of, of risk, somebody just said, um, that they respected the organization that did the study. I'm going to give you a little bit of background. For, first thing to know, and maybe they are a respectable organization, but the company that was hired to do the so-called risk analysis that wasn't a risk analysis already had a multi-million dollar contract with Los Alamos under a project called La Hadra, which some of you know the historical document records retrieval. So if you've got a multi-million dollar contract with a polluter, and Santa Fe hires you under a $200,000 contract to tell you whether the polluter's pollution is a problem, the chances are the answer is going to come out it's not. So that's the first thing is you don't hire a company with a conflict of interest. The second, the company was famous for one of the greatest environmental frauds perpetrated in history. Does everybody know what it was? Aaron Brock, the Aaron Brockovich case. They got hired by PG&E to break the link between hexavalent chromium and groundwater and cancer. I mean, that was one of the most brilliant frauds, and they would have gotten away with it, potentially, had it not been for the intrepid lawyer who wasn't a lawyer, Aaron Brockovich, who busted them for that. And there's always a trick on how they do this, you know, how you fake a risk analysis to claim that there's no risk. And in California, they reanalyze the data 
um, and, and published it under the original author's byline, and to, you know, to claim there was no risk, there, there was no connection between hexavalent and groundwater and cancer. And in Santa Fe, the trick was they assumed that every time toxic pollution was flowing down these canyons and into the Rio Grande, that the operators would turn the pumps off and that that toxin would go down. See, they used the theory that most of the time the Rio Grande is safe enough to drink. <coughs> most of the time it's safe to drink the Rio Grande. To me, it's like saying most of the time it's safe to stand on a railway train. <laughs> it's a true statement. <laughs> but it's not a lot of good if you're on the track at the wrong time. And it's not a lot of good to us if the pumps are running and pumping when those toxins are flowing. We'll get to it more later. Two years after it began, the fall of 2010 now, two years after it began, construction is finishing up. Santa Fe releases the final report on risk, which claims that lentil contaminants pose no health risk to Santa Feans. At this point, I write a letter to the New Mexican questioning the study that concluded no health risk, suggesting that we've lost our understanding of the concept of risk and contending that the probability of lentil contaminants eventually entering Santa Fe's drinking water system is roughly 100%. Now that's, I can go into that, but mathematically, again, if you agree to engage in risky behavior ad infinitum and you're not going to stop, you will hurt yourself. It's 100% guaranteed. January 2011, the Buckman bullet begins delivering water to Santa Fe, supplying one-half to two-thirds of all water consumed. So we didn't just turn it on and it became a minor player. We are now reliant on that system. In fact, if you read this morning's paper, Las Campanas is reliant on that system because when it's not pumping, they can't get water to their golf course. They declared a golfing emergency. <laughs> Did y'all read this? It's in this morning's paper. Golfing emergency. <laughs> is, is this the context under which we're going to solve this problem? I have no idea. Okay. Um, January 2011, the Buckman goes online. Uh, rare winter tornadoes strike Cincinnati, St. Louis, and Mississippi. You don't remember that? January 1st, 2011. Strange. Okay, fast forward. June 26, 2011. The Los Punches. Oh, is that 2011? 2020? 2011. 2011. Oh, yeah, it is. The Los Punches fire was a year ago? Yeah. Wow. The Los Punches fire ignites and within five days becomes the largest fire, uh, wildfire in New Mexico history. It burns out of control on Lionel's perimeter, eventually torching 150,000 acres of trees, concentrating the pollutants absorbed by those trees over many years into a thin layer of ash on the ground. Now, all, all of you know this, and actually this is good coming after Dr. Barcelona, because when all of these toxins, especially when you do above ground explosions, and you have these toxins vaporizing, you know, trees are tremendous air filters. They breathe, and they do this for you. They breathe, and they take toxins out of the air. When you set that tree, over many years, when you set that tree on fire, all of those toxins fall to the ground in the ash. And we know what happens from there. Uh, July 15, 2011, Buckman is shut down as the Rio Grande runs black. July 22 through August 3rd, three monsoon rainstorms in Los Alamos carry ash down the canyons into the Rio Grande. The sediment concentrations are so large that samples collected from the flows must be analyzed as solids rather than liquids. So, you know, when these toxic flows come down the canyons, there is a monitoring system in place and it has an automatic sampler. When they detect the flow, the samplers start, you know, dipping their little bill in the water and taking little samples that can then be sent to the lab. <laughs> Except at this time, they weren't sticking their bill in the water, they were digging into sand and they had to be analyzed as, as solids. A sample drawn from the Rio Grande, so now we have this flow coming down, and we're not measuring that flow, we're measuring the Rio Grande while that flow is going into it. A sample drawn from the Rio Grande shows a gross alpha concentration of 71 picocuries per liter, nearly five times the drinking water standard. By this time, you're all getting pretty good at understanding these numbers. The drinking water standard is 15, and I think Arjun would argue that that's 100 times too high. It should be 0.15. So if the standard, what the EPA believes is okay, is, seven, is 5, the Rio Grande is now running at 71. A sample of the finished water from Buckman Water Treatment Plant shows 3 picocuries per liter of gross alpha. So somebody asked about that before, do we have tests on the finished water? Yes, there are a lot, and that is one of the highest readings recorded for gross alpha in the finished water. So now the water coming out the back of the treatment plant, admittedly below the standard, not below Argent's, recommended standard, but below the EPA standard. 
uh, three picofuries per liter radiation, gross alpha radiation in the water that's being injected in the Santa Fe's water supply. August 4 through September 1, six more storms hit Los Alamos Canyon, including back-to-back -back gully washers that wipe out the apple orchard started by Fred Dixon in 1940. Maybe you don't call them gully washers, that was a term for bad keys. What do you call them in New Mexico? Gully washers. Gully washers, okay. Flash flood. Black flood. Black flood. Black flood. Black flood. Black flood. yeah, that worked. Samples of the stormwater flowing down the canyons drawn just before they dump in the Rio Grande. Again, there's a monitoring station just before these canyon flows dump in the Rio Grande. Contain PCBs at 470 times the standard. Dioxins. You all know what dioxin is, right? It's the most toxic substance. Huh? 275 times the standard. Gross alpha radiation at 340 times the standard. Samples from the Rio Grande contain gross alpha radiation at 64 times the standard. Buckman operators resume pumping on September 1st, right after these storms. Buckman operators resume pumping on September 1st and draw 3 million gallons out of the river before another storm forces another shutdown. That was through September 1. September 4th, a major rainstorm hits Los Alamos at around dinner time, and a storm flow measuring 630 CFS charges down Los Alamos Canyon toward the Rio Grande. Now you get some of the idea what these CFS numbers. The 630 CFS flow is enormous. That's bigger, that's a couple of times what the Rio Blanco was running up at Pagosa. The flow contains gross alpha radiation at nearly 300 times the standard. The flow dumps into the river, raising the alpha radiation level in the Rio Grande to nearly 30 times the standard. Buckman operators fail to shut down the pumps for a full two hours after the flow has been detected. So pumping an estimated 300,000 gallons of toxic water into the water system. And I suspect most of you are hearing this for the first time. I've not really been very public with this knowledge. I'm not really sure what to do with this knowledge. September 6th, pumping resumes. September 7th, 2011, another rainstorm, this one just after the lunch hour, catches Buckman operators off guard. Though the storm is producing an 80 CFS flow down Los Alamos Canyon. It's a lot smaller this time. Operators fail to shut off the system the, until the canyon has been flowing for 134 minutes. The stormwater flowing into the canyon is less toxic this time, containing gross alpha radiation at nearly 40 times the standard, but nearly a half million gallons of toxic Rio Grande water is again pumped into the Santa Fe water system. Now, don't faint because this water that's toxic that's being pumped into the system goes to a sedimentation facility and many of these toxins are bound to sediments which come out of the sedimentation facility and get dumped back in the river. Regardless of how you feel about that, that's what happens. This is an interesting point. Once, the sediments are li once these toxins are liberated, they go somewhere. And they either go in your body, you know, hopefully not, or they go back in the Rio Grande, or they go to the water treatment plant, and they get taken out, and guess where they go? Albuquerque. No, they haul them to the Caja del Rio landfill if they get all the way to the treatment plant. So this is the second pumping error by Buckman operators. Half a million gallons of toxic rear groundwater. And when I say this 134 minutes, by the way, when the storm is first detected, it's not like it, that you have to shut down the Buckman pumps immediately. Depending on the flow rate of the Rio Grande, it's between 30 and 75 minutes. Some people say as much as 90 minutes before that toxic water gets down. But at 134 minutes between the toxins flowing and the Rio Grande pump, uh, the Buckman pumps being shut down, I estimate about a half a million gallons of toxic water within the system on that occasion. They shut off the pumps for a while, then September 16th, the Buckman pumps begin drawing water again from the Rio Grande just after midnight. Despite the fact that rains before midnight created a flow in Los Alamos Canyon of 8 CFS, so now we're talking about a very small flow. But for the next nine hours, water is drawn out of the Rio Grande while the canyon is flowing toxic water into the Rio Grande. So here we have all day, nine hours of pumping, about 16 acre feet of water get pumped out while there's a low level toxic flow just three miles up from the plane. October 1st, New Mexico Environment Department measures gross alpha radiation in the finished water from Buckman at 0 0.9 picofuries per liter. Again, a pretty small number by anyone's standard except Arjun, the guy who knows, who thinks it should be 0.15, so still 
we still have an issue with radiation in the finished water being injected into Santa Fe's water. Um, now we're going to way fast forward. June 28, 2012. The Santa Fe, New Mexico runs a story affirming that Buckman personnel have confidence that the early warning system will stop any land with contaminants from entering Santa Fe's drinking water supply. I mean, what was the purpose of this article? This came out right at, this came out right at the time. 628-2012. System to stop storm runoff from entering city water supply. While northern New Mexico awaits the arrival of another summer monsoon season, managers of the River Diversion Project in the Rio Grande are confident an early warning system will prevent any stormwater flowing past old Los Alamos National Laboratory waste sites from entering Santa Fe's drinking water supply. Who wrote that article? Uh, a reporter for the New Mexican. <laughs> I'm not picking on anybody in particular here, but I mean, you know, this, as near as I can tell, this is a cheerleading article. So what's the purpose of that? I don't know. Um, it gets better. Uh, July 25, the Santa Fe New Mexican runs a story about this conference. July 25, right? Was that yesterday? Yeah. Yesterday. Um, coalition to host Clean Water Forum. And they're talking about the 60 high-priority dump sites with the PCB levels in it. Those sites are located on lab property, some near canyons that drain into the Rio Grande. All of them, John? Some. An ongoing concern is that contaminants from the dump sites will reach the Rio Grande. <laughs> <laughs> Hasn't happened yet, sir. So then it gets even better. I mean, I, I already told you about today. You know, Council of K's Las Campanas golf courses, this golfing emergency. City officials learned Tuesday that golf course managers reported a water supply emergency at the golf course. And then they voted 5 to 3 last night to allocate, which it raises the consumption of the Santa Fe water system by 10%. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. 10%. And it's only going to be allowed for two weeks, you see. So that's kind of where we are on that. Um, so get up there and go, what's that? Yeah. No, so that's pretty much what I had to say. I mean, what I want to do is be realistic about what we're talking about. You know, I mean, all of you, this is why I applaud you for coming to a clean water conference. Let's be realistic about this. We're talking not about a water supply for the city and county of Santa Fe. We're talking about a clean water supply. What could possibly be more important to your community than a clean water supply? And a series of bad decisions... I think have led us to a point where we're taking a huge risk with our water supply. I mean, and as I say, if you want to say that there's no chance of contaminating the water supply, I would point to the three pumping errors made last year by the Buckman personnel. So there is a risk. We face a great risk in what we're doing. And how we alleviate that risk, I don't know. What I, I think what I firmly hope is that this move of putting your drinking water supply underneath where a toxic waste dump, you know, washes into the river, could be the Smartest thing we ever did, because it could mobilize all of us to, you know, to have Lionel finally clean up those dump sites. And I think we have maybe the greatest opportunity that's ever arisen to stop the construction of a weapons production facility up there should they decide to manufacture nuclear pits, because we drink the water underneath. If you want to know a little bit about statistics and probability, there are a number of rivers running underneath a number of nuclear production sites around this country. And in 100% of the cases when you build a nuclear production facility, you contaminate the surrounding area. And if there's a river running underneath where you're building it, you contaminate the river in 100% of the cases. The Snake River, the Chief, the Columbia. You know, every one of them has ended up polluted. So we have the greatest opportunity in history, I think, to stop the production of, uh, or to stop the construction of a nuclear uh, weapons production facility. And that's the opportunity we need to take away from the misfortune that is the button diversion. Anyway, thanks for your attention.